Hi, and thanks for joining us for episode two of Hot Topics with Hot Rod. Let's mix it up. I'm Erin Hollihan Haskell, president of HeatingHelp.com, and we're thrilled to partner with Kalefi on this webinar series. Coming to us live from his workshop on Know It All Lane is our friend and industry expert, Hot Rod Roar of Kalefi North America. Hot Rod has over 30 years of experience as a plumbing, radiant heat, and renewable energy contractor, and I'm so grateful that he's going to share some of that knowledge with us tonight. Thank you, Hot Rod. Thank you for the nice intro. Um, I guess we'll just jump right into it. So, um, episode number two, I thought we'd talk about mixing valves, and I think I build it as we talk about um, all types of mixing valves, thermostatic, and uh, motorized different types of mixing valves, but as I got into it, I had so much information on thermostatics that it's going to be pretty much thermostatics, but we'll cover uh, plumbing and heating stuff, and then maybe we'll do one on motorized valves in the future. So let's go through a couple uh, housekeeping slides here. Uh, very informal, you know, if you want to raise your hand, we'll try and open the mic and talk to you if you want to try that, or raise your hand and type in a question. Kevin and Mark are going to help me with uh, uh, questions on the back end. They can maybe type some answers in as we roll through here, but yeah, we'd love to talk to you if we can. Uh, uh, you know, open the mic and hear what you have to say. A little bit of housekeeping. This is just really on the top here. Basically, some uh, go to meeting, go to webinar support. If ever you have trouble with this or any other go to meeting or go to webinar, uh, they do have a pretty good tech support line there. That's the 800 number. Certainly, you can get information uh, online. They'll help you online and stuff too. The, the main thing that happens when these things crash or they go bad is if you start to, it starts getting jerky or something like that, or the audio starts to go bad. Lots of times you can just kind of, you know, get out and come back in and you'll come in through another connection. And it seems uh, to work for us when we have people do that, that are having uh, trouble getting a, a good clean picture out of it. So uh, we will archive these, uh, both Erin uh, at Heating Help will have these in her archive and uh, Cleffy on our YouTube channel will put this up. So um, if you want to watch it again, who you knows somebody else that couldn't be here tonight that you think might enjoy it, um, spread the word. So um, that's what we did last week. That's what we're doing tonight. We've got two more episodes that we've got uh, kind of keyed up. Um, August 10th, uh, we'll talk about pressure. And again, I think I'll talk about both um, pressure in bu buildings, uh, potable water pressure, uh, how we regulate that, how we control it, and some uh, products and information about that, and probably a little bit about uh, pressure in hydronic closed loop systems. So. I think we can get both of those in the one evening. And then uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing on episode number four yet. I want to talk something about, um, especially now that we're opening up buildings that haven't been uh, occupied for a while, talk about some of the procedures and steps you want to take if you're uh, involved in that type of uh, uh, process, you know, opening buildings that might have some bacteria or something lurking in them. So that's kind of what I have in mind there. I think I've got one more. Yeah, so we're going to do a, a fundraiser out of this, and we're going to do a couple things. Number one, on the right there, I want to thank uh, our owner, Marco Kleffi, the owner of Kleffi uh, Worldwide, I guess. He was very generous and donated 1 million euros um, to help the cause over in Italy once a couple of hospitals <laughs> buy some equipment and stuff. So that was uh, that was big of him. That's a, that's a lot of uh, uh, euros, dineros, I guess they used to be their euros now, or liras, I guess they used to be, but... Uh, Thanks for that. And then tonight, we've got a charity that we're really uh, happy to uh, bring in, and I'm going to let the gals talk about this a little bit. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Judalyn Cassidy, founder of Tools and Tiaras, and she was kind enough to join us this evening to tell us a little bit about her program. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay, unmuted. Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good. We got you. Okay, okay. So, should I could start? Go ahead and start? yeah, tell us. Tell us oh, jump on in. Okay, yes, it's like the job site. Jump on in there and start working, girl. <laughs> so, my name is Judalyn Cassidy. I have been a plumber for over 20 years plus. Um, I stopped counting because then it ages me. So, but I started plumbing at um, 18 years old. I attended, I wanted to be a lawyer growing up and I lived, I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago with my great grandmother. And when she passed away, I didn't have the ability or the financial means to attend university to study law. And uh, the trades was the next best free option. So 
I kind of strategically thought to myself, um, back then, my generation, people know about shorthand, typing, uh, culinary arts, seamstress, and those were some of the uh, courses that were available, but I knew a lot of women would be applying for those and my chances would be less. <laughs> so I strategically thought about uh, maybe applying for electrical or plumbing, but I remember electrical, you get shocked, plumbing, you get wet. So it was easy. I got wet. I just decided to get wet. <laughs> so I chose plumbing. And the minute I chose plumbing, I, I, as a time went by, I just fell in love with it. And I'm still madly in love with being a plumber. People don't get that. But I love my job. I love being a plumber. And a lot of times on the job sites for years, I would be the only woman, not just the only plumber, but like the only woman on huge construction sites and just by myself. And uh, it took me a while to just like be confident and know that yeah, you belong here. And uh, once I sh made that shift, my world opened up and I, I had a couple bad experiences, but most of all, I would say I had amazing brothers that stood up for me and said, you're not gonna be half a double S, you're gonna be a really good plumber and made sure that I learned my trade and be really skilled at it. And um, so I always tell everyone that I'm the best plumber I know, uh, hands down. <laughs> so that's kind of like my inside little joke. But, uh, but then I saw the girl that I grew up, I didn't have any confidence in myself because I didn't grow up with my mother or father or knowing if they ever loved me or even cared. So I had those issues, but the funny thing was, I think what's so Im what is amazing about the trades, the power of the tools. Once I realized that I can master tools, I was like, what? I can master anything. And it shifted the way I viewed myself in the world. I finally believed that I was here for a reason. And I didn't feel like I didn't want to be here anymore. Like I used to have that thought as a continuous music playing in my head that you don't belong here nobody wanted you and uh tools changed that becoming a plumber yo that changed that big time and but i moved to the united states and i got married and i came here but i didn't get back into plumbing right away uh i was a housekeeper a nanny a babysitter and a personal shopper for a little while before i got back into plumbing and i was able to get into the plumber's local first woman to get into the plumbers local 371 uh because of an amazing brother who is still my friend and mentor brian Totora spoke up on my behalf and i got into the union and it changed my life and it changed my family's life and without being a plumber i wouldn't have been able to have that dream of starting tools and tiaras so i wanted something where girls could would never feel like I did growing up not like they didn't like they didn't belong or uh they didn't have that confidence so I've been wanting to do this for a long time but I can't do anything half throttle so I just kept on pushing it back and I was invited to speak at a makers conference and in my speech I said that we should give a girl a tool and a tiara which is given a confidence, independence, and most of all, power. And then the universe and God, however you want to believe it, said to me, you know that thing that you always wanted to do for the girls? You got to do it. And that's where the name came from, that speech. So I obeyed and I said, but you know, it's going to be a lot of work. And I, I came back and I Googled how to start a nonprofit and how to trademark. And, and I've been basically running a nonprofit for the last three years on Google. So wow. anybody could do <laughs> anybody could do anything they want. You can just I just figure out how to do the things. And I think that comes from being a plumber, that strength from that. But I started Tools and Tiaras and I funded it for a long time with my own money. I picked up bottles, cans on the job site. I sold one of my favorite cars. I did whatever I had to do to fuel this because I knew what it was going to do for girls because um, they're my passion. I don't like running a nonprofit. I just consider myself 
to be the founder. I love teaching the girls and I love teaching the workshops and that's where my passion lies. And I do all of these other things um, because it has to be done in order for it to be successful. And as soon as I keep getting more people <laughs> to do these other things, like writing emails, I still actually, I just finished working overtime. I'm in my car sitting, talking to you guys. I still work as a plumber with tools every single day because I'm not ready to um, hang up the tool belt or put away the soldering torch or put away the wrench. So I still actually work as a plumber full time while running the nonprofit. So at Tools and Tiaras, our mission is really just too, you know, like simple, just expose girls, inspire them and mentor them about careers in the trades and just to show them that jobs don't have genders. And we really, really making a difference. Like uh, today, I got an email that I started crying, so I'll just share it. I can't read it because we're on there, but I'll power, like shorten it up. Uh, Penelope is one of our, our girls that her mother brought her to a plumbing welding workshop. And she wrote a beautiful article about her experience, you know, uh, coming to Tools and Tiaras workshop. Today, she sent me an email saying, because of you and Tools and Tiaras, I have signed up to be in a CTE school and I would have never done that if I hadn't come to Tools and Tiaras and go to the workshops and to the camp. And because of you, one day I will be a future architect or an engineer. And that's the kind of effect we have in, on girls like her, Tanzara. Um, a lot of the girls are the only girl in their robotics class, the only girl in whatever. And they know they can do it because they've met so many amazing women plumbers, electricians, iron workers, welders, every, you know, every trade I could possibly expose them to. We have um, free monthly workshops and an all girls summer camp that they come and literally learn how to build. And I don't really tell the parents so much what I'm going to do because I know they're going to get scared. Like you really teaching my six year old girl to solder. And then the girls go home and tell them I was welding and I was soldering. <laughs> so we have insurance and all of those things, but it's just that I don't want the girls to be crippled by their parents' fears. So D, once we do it and the girls can say, I welded, I did carpentry, I use a chop saw, it changes their world. And to see their parents sending us um, pictures of Izzy fixing plumbing under the sink, yeah, that is cool. And uh, and that's what I just want to continue with Tools and Tiaras is to just expose girls to all of these amazing careers in the trades. And I believe that the trades is what made our country, you know, the beautiful place that it is. And uh, I want us as a nation to respect the trades that like we do for other um, occupations. So my passion, I travel all over the country. Sometimes I've traveled outside of the world, speaking about the power of the trades and what is done for a, a girl from the Caribbean island who, you know, doesn't have a college degree and is able to make over $100,000 a year in New York City. And now I get to give back to the country that I love and the girls that I love, I call them princess warriors. And, uh, and that's a little bit about... Uh, what Tools and Tiaras and our mission is to just let girls everywhere know that they have absolutely have the ability to build any dream, any career that they want. But I just want them to be in the trades. That's, you know, my thing. <laughs> and that's a little bit about Tools and Tiaras. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to just share my passion about plumbing and about the trades. And I'm really grateful that you were doing this for us because we don't really have like a lot of big funders, um, people that funders. I mean, at least I'm not putting all my salary back into it anymore as I was before, but I, you know, I, I still just want us to know that if you really believe in the power of the traits that we all are here, we need to invest in the CTE schools and invest in programs that are really exposing the girls. And thank you so much for giving me this platform and I'll send it back to Hara. <laughs> well, that was great. That, that 
that's a good story. And yeah, we hope everybody will be generous tonight and donate. And then we're going to both uh, Heating Help and Club, you're going to match the donation. So we'll see if we can uh, uh, hit a home run here for you. And thanks for, for all you do for the for the gals. And go to the website. There's a lot to learn at your website. I was there yesterday, kind of snooping around to learn nice. a bit about the group. So, all right, Aaron, anything else? I think we'll move on if everybody's um, ready. Thank you, Jadalyn. Thank you, thank yeah. you, everyone, and uh, have a great uh, webinar. I I have to run because I just got um, pulled up in a parking lot at work. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got to check out. I got to click out. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. Well, that was nice. All right. So, well, I will start uh, with a giveaway, I guess. So, <clears throat> now this one's a little tricky. I'm, I'm speaking uh, big here. Think big worldwide, not in the U.S. necessarily. So, um, who gets credit for the first radiant floor heating system? And um, actually, I learned a little bit more about this today as I was... <laughs> making sure I had the right answer for this before I put the question out there. So we'll give you a minute or two to think about that. And then the um, you get a t-shirt. The winner will get a t-shirt or maybe we'll have a couple winners and we'll we'll give out some t-shirts. So think about that for a minute and you can uh, uh, type in an answer if you think you know. In fact, that maybe I'll skip two slides ahead, Mary, if you wanna watch that for a minute, unless somebody jumped right out and had an answer, we'll um, I'll keep talking and just skip over the I think the next Bob, slide. How, uh, this is Mary, but how specific do you want uh, the answer to be? <laughs> um, I guess a country would be good enough because the, the name, I didn't know the name until I saw it today. In fact, I can't pronounce the name of the fellow or a person, I should say. Um, so, yeah, get me close. Up. Maybe a, a time period or a country of origin would be, I think, mm -hmm. fair enough. Okay. We've got a joker saying it was in British Columbia, Canada. <laughs> We've had a couple of winners in the past, so uh, smart up there. So, think so you have anything, or should I roll a little bit? Well, we have James um, Petreca. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce that correctly, but he said the Romans. Yep, fair enough, close enough. And uh, I put the slide. In fact, I was researching today, and I came across one of Robert Bean's posts. Got permission to use this, and uh, yeah, he took it even further than that. It was a oyster farmer, an oyster farmer, I guess. Uh, that's his name. Let's call him uh, uh, Giso, just to make that easy. <laughs> was the fellow? So, and then over the years, different places in the in the world kind of adopted the same theory, where they, I guess, basically built a fire under the building and the tunnels under the building to heat the um, heat the floor. So, yeah, that that's the uh, uh, the story that I'm sticking to. So, and obviously, if you want to read more about it, this was a good article that uh, Robert and his team at uh, at Ashray put together about the origins of uh, radiant heat and cooling. So, thanks for playing the game. All right, we'll get into it, hot topic. So I wanna look at mixing valves. We're gonna look inside of one. We're gonna do a little demo here that I put together on the uh, on the shop floor, showing some uh, little tricks and tips that might help you along the way. We'll talk about sizing and some of the errors that are made when people apply these. And again, this is gonna be both for um, uh, domestic water applications as well as hydronic applications. So why would I use a mixing valve? It's probably one of the most um, used valves, I would say, in the world, just by the number of them that we make at our factory. One of many players that makes this type of valve and they go way back in history maybe da vinci invented the first one in italy i think powers probably gets the, the credit of uh, the first one in the in the u.s uh, market to build this type of valve but you know we'll use it to extend the tank drawdown you know if we have a water heater we'll get, get a little bit more drawdown out of it we can raise the temperature mix it down to a safe temperature and mixing valve uh, more and more we're using it for uh, bacteria mitigation we want to elevate the temperature of our tank and maybe an entire loop in the building to kill off any uh, bacteria that might be growing in there so it could be used as a safety device in that respect and also for um, Hydronic systems, very common to use it for mixing valve to mix down for lower temperature zone off a high temperature loop perhaps. And then some unique applications. And here along that uh, theme is a valve that we make um, in the European market. We don't import this valve. I've got a, a demo of it here in my shop, but you look closely at this, it's actually three thermostatic valves that have been built into one central body, one forging. And what it does is actually a mixing valve can also be used as a diverting valve. So if you look up here, what's going on, if you have a solar thermal, which is fairly common in Europe, um, it's going to supply the water from the solar thermal directly to the load um, as long as it can. And when that temperature drops below, what is that, about 113 degrees F, I think, 45 C, 
If it drops below that at some point, then what it does, it diverts and it goes through the boiler, comes back out of the boiler, typically a tankless water heater over there, and supplies to the load. And then this third valve here is the valve that uh, blends down that temperature. Because what could happen if the solar gets up to, say, 70 C or a high uh, temperature, we certainly don't want to send that uh, temperature directly to the building, to the load. So that's why we have the third mixing valve is the, uh, I guess, the distribution valve, you could call it. So that's something that, um, you know, that's a series of mixing valves that are kind of used. If you can look at the flow path here in kind of a, a backwards configuration, in fact, you could build this on your bench if you bought three Kalepi, of course, a thermostatic mixing valve and pipe them together like this. We actually built some prototypes uh, for one of the tankless water heater manufacturers back in, what, 08, 09, when solar was really hot. <clears throat> they approached us about building some of these for uh, to go with their tankless water heater and solar thermal packages. So, um, yeah, it does more than just mix temperature down. It can also be uh, a diverting valve and uh, used for a lot of uh, other mixing and blending applications. So. I want to go through some of the important numbers, and when you look at the spec sheet on a thermostatic mixing valve, and this this is typical of most valves out there. I think we give a little bit more information than some of the other brands out there, but some of the you know typical things, the way the valve is built, what type of materials we use, a peroxide cured EPDM for the um, the O-rings and stuff in here. Um, we show 30%. Yeah, I know they probably get used for 50% glycol more often than 30 because that's what comes out of the pre-mixed buckets that you folks are buying at the wholesaler. So um, until we can get Italy to sign off on a higher number there, um, that's the number we put on it. But um, we know they're out there on other higher mixed percentages. So wide range of adjustability on our valve, which is nice. So if you want to use it for low temperature radiant mixing, or if you want to go up to a high temperature, you know, domestic water application, maybe for a, a restaurant or something like that, where you need that higher temperature, we've got a wide range. This is a number plus or minus that really comes um, from the spec on it. Uh, that's the tolerance that we have to meet for the temperature. Pressures, this gets a little bit confusing. Let's see if I can uh, explain it, that it makes sense. The 200 PSI um, maximum working pressure, that's really what the forging can handle. If we pressure test that, that's what we design it to, that's what we build it to, that's the absolute highest pressure that that body can withstand or that we rate it to or list it to. Now, these other numbers are a little confusing here. So this is called the maximum operating differential pressure. And that means if water was flowing through this device, I could take a drop in pressure from a high pressure coming in here at say, uh, I pick a number, say 100 150 PSI coming into this, which obviously you typically wouldn't have that. As that valve is flowing, I don't want to see more than a 75 pound pressure drop through that valve. Now that would probably be a pretty noisy valve under those conditions. That would be a pretty high flow rate. More realistically, when an engineer size or selects a valve like that, they're going to look at more like a 20 PSI uh, pressure differentials that valve is operating as it's flowing through there. You got your static pressure when it's just sitting there with no flow. As we start flowing through the valve, you've got pressure drop, as you can see through all the uh, commotion that's going inside here. That's what those two numbers mean. This number here, actually, we do get calls on this occasionally. The tech support people tell me they'll get a call, and it has to do with this number here. So it's the maximum inlet pressure ratio from one side to the other. And the question comes, well, why would the pressure be different on one side or the other? If this is on a, a home system and you got 60 pounds of water pressure, don't you have 60 pounds here and don't you have 60 pounds on the hot side? Well, maybe not. And here's where it comes into play mostly, most of the tech uh, support calls. People that have a, a, a boiler with a tankless coil in it, and the coil starts to get scaled up, so you've got a small opening in there, and let's say I've got 60 PSI water pressure coming into my home, into my building, going through that tankless coil, and you start opening faucets. You open one, two, multiple faucets, and with a scaled up coil in there, you'll get a high pressure drop going through there. So even though I could have 60 pounds of pressure on my cold side, the pressure on my hot side will drop down based on the restriction in that uh, tankless coil. Um, the same thing can happen with, um, well, maybe a restaurant has a hot water takeoff before the mixing valve here going to a high temperature load and they start flowing a lot of water through maybe a commercial dishwasher drop the pressure there my pressure can drop down so i need to stay within this range right here for this valve to operate properly uh, accurately correctly let's say uh, again, that's a big number, obviously, from a two to one ratio there, but it does happen in some cases. We'll get that call, and the first question that the tech support guys will ask, well, tell me where the hot water is coming from. What's the application? And usually from that, they can run down the uh, what could be causing the valve to uh, misbehave, let's put it. Uh, this number, this is a critical number, and this varies a little bit from brand to brand. I, I think I put a couple of other examples of other brands as we go through here. But this temperature right here, 27 degrees, and that's the... Um, 
the maximum temperature difference between um, the, mix, the hot water coming in and the mixed temperature going out. So let, and let me just use an analogy maybe to explain that best. Let's say I want to have a mixed temperature of the, uh, going out of this valve at say 120 degrees and I've got a water heater supplying 130 degrees. There's not enough differential between that 130 and the 120 that I'm trying to mix that valve for this valve to be accurate. We'd like to see, uh, we say 27, some other brands might say 25, the number varies a little bit. 27, we know we'll get a good mix. Um, now that's not to say the valve is going to completely stop working if you don't have uh, this kind of temperature differential between your hot coming in and your mix going out. It'll just, uh, it won't be accurate. What can happen is you'll get a mixed temperature that's exactly right for a minute and then it'll get a little bit warmer, then it might get a little bit colder. And the valve is what we call hunting. It doesn't have enough um, resolution might be a good word uh, for this cartridge in here, which we're going to show you a cutaway of how that works, to get enough temperature variance for that cartridge to be able to expand and contract and accurately regulate the temperature going out. So I guess the bottom line there is if you want 120 degrees going out of your mixed port, you want to have 27 degrees warmer coming into your hot port to be stable, to be accurate, to be assured that that valve can uh, to respond correctly to what it's trying to do. Um, and that, and that also comes into play with a hydronic mixing system. If you're doing a hydronic loop on a radiant and you're trying to get, let's say, 100 degree going out to that radiant, and maybe you've got a mod convoyer running at 110 degrees to keep it in a sweet uh, condensing mode, again, you don't have enough resolution, enough differential there. You might have to crank up that um, the temperature coming in that hot port to make sure that you get an accurate temperature going out on the mix port. So just pay attention to that number. And if you get a troubleshooting call and that's what's happening, the valve is... Um, Thready might be a good definition for what's happening. Just know that it could be the temperature on the hot port needs to be jacked up a little bit so this valve can get back into the into the ball game, so to speak. Um, and also we need, um, uh, th that varies a little bit on the larger size valves. Obviously, as the body of this chamber gets bigger, you can see on the graph here, I showed a couple of different sizes of the, the valves on the, um, on the requirement for that uh, minimum flow rate and that temperature response, poor temperature response. And here's what's a, the issue about a thermostat mixing valve when we talk about the flow restriction. As you can see, there's quite a bit going on here. In fact, I can probably show you a little bit better on an on upcoming slide. This is critical, too, and this gets missed, missed quite a bit as people don't um, install a check valve with these valves. There should really be a check, there should be a check valve on the hot and cold port for the same reason we use check valves on any other device. We want to make sure that we don't have a cross flow. If we do have a pressure imbalance, we don't want that going across from one side, pushing back into the, uh, maybe a cold, pushing back into the hot. We want to make sure that we don't get a thermal siphon. You know, hot water is going to want to try and go up through the valve. If you've got a load above it, cold water will come down. We can get some flow going through it when we don't need it, go on it. Um, certainly, if we're going to put a a domestic water recirculation system where that pump's going to add a little delta P to the system. We want to make sure that doesn't cross over the valve. So we make it easy for you to do that. We have these tail pieces that are available. Um, this one is a press version, as you can see here. It's got a check valve built into it. Uh, we can get to these in threaded or sweat. Uh, we can give you a standalone check valve if you want to move the check valve downstream somewhere. Uh, this is a great little check valve that we make that's serviceable, which is really nice. You can take the two unions, split it apart, and get inside here to the check if you had to clean it out or service it or replace it in some case. And on our bigger valves, um, we actually have one that'll screw right onto the thread that's on the side of the valve where the tail pieces connect with the um, with the nut. This goes on there, and then, of course, your connection nut and uh, whatever fitting you want would go onto that side of it. Under the hood, they're just basically a, ne a neoperl type of check valve. It's a spring-loaded check. It's got a very friendly flow path. It's got a, a conical seat to it. It's got, I don't know if you can see, a little rubber seal in here, so you get a nice, nice bubble-free uh, seal in it. And it's got a little bit of spring tension, so it's going to close even under a low flow condition. So that's really uh, the best type of check valve, in my opinion, not only for um, domestic water application, but also for um, hydronic applications. You get a good tight seal. Keep an eye on my time here. So the three CV, let me talk a little bit about what CV is, what it means, and why it's so important on this type of valve. So this, this number right here, three CV, means if I were flowing three gallons a minute out of this valve, and let's say I've got a 60 pounds of water pressure coming in this valve, once I get up to where I've got three gallons a minute flowing through this, I'm opening faucets, opening faucets, I know I've got three gallon a minute flow through it, I'm going to have a one PSI pressure drop. 
So the 60 pounds of pressure that I might be measuring here will be 59 pounds of pressure on the outlet side when three gallons a minute is flowing through it. Now you could explain that different ways, but that's just a number that the industry uh, came up with and uh, assigned to a valve. So what we do when we build a valve or engineer a valve, we'll flow test it on a test bench and we'll come up with that number. And pretty much any valve that you buy out there, you should be able to find that number, a ball valve, a, a mixing valve, a, a zone valve, even pneumatic valves, air pressure valves have CV ratings on them because that's how we know how to size the valve properly. And in a perfect world, we would buy a valve for the CV of the flow rate that we expect out of this valve. So let's say I've got a job where I want to have eight gallons a minute going out to a, a load, to a building, to a, a mixed uh, radiant system or something like that. I'd, ideally, I'd like to buy an eight CV valve. Well, there's not going you're not going to find a two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight CV valve. So we're going to have to interpolate. We're going to have to look at the flow drop going, the pressure drop going through that valve at different flow rates based on that CV number and come up with a valve that's uh, acceptable that will give us the flow without too much pressure drop. And I'll show you a chart that you can calculate that. And here's the reason why this valve, you say, well, gosh, it's a three quarter one inch valve. How come such a low GPM flow rate through that valve? Well, there's your answer. As you can see, just looking at number one, the forging, that's, gosh, that's about a quarter inch opening right there on the hot and cold port of this valve. Notice one's at the top and one's at the bottom here. And so what happens is this cartridge just spool moves up and down in there as it opens one window it's closing off the opposite window the same amount so that's how the valve regulates its temperature just by opening it's kind of like a double hung window on your house as you open the upper part the bottom part you can close the same amount that's what's going on here so there's your first restriction in that valve just the, the window that we have to have there and that has to be small so this cartridge in there can uh, modulate across that opening now the water's come in there and it goes around, you know, let's see if I've got one here, it goes around the outside of this cartridge and it has to go through this spool, into this spool, then down through the cartridge here, into where the little heat motor, I'll call it down here, we'll show that next. So the bottom line is there's just so much going on in here, so much has to be in there for this valve to be able to function and do its job that there's gonna be a lot of pressure drop. There's just really no way around a thermostatic mixing valve with a high pressure drop. Yeah, we can go to bigger valves and make these ports bigger, but there's gonna be a trade-off there also. So that's why when you see a valve, you're gonna see a typical half, three quarter, even one inch valve is gonna have maybe two, three, 3.9. I think I saw one of our competitors on a one inch um, typical thermostatic mixing valve. And it's because of everything that's going on in there. So here's an exploded view that kind of shows it a little bit better. So this is the, the top of it, and that's where you would put tension with the, uh, the knob or the nut on the top of here, put tension on the spring, tension on this, and this is what's called the heat motor. And basically what this is, I just cut one apart to show you exactly what it is. It's a little uh, copper capsule, and inside that capsule is kind of a ground up uh, potion, a mix of, uh, of paraffin wax and ground up copper. In fact, if you put it on your finger, you'll have uh, copper stains on your finger from that. And so that goes into the cartridge and it gets sealed. And so now when uh, temperature hits this, this is either going to expand or contract based on the temperature difference across that. And this little uh, piston, let's call it, is going to move up and down. And that's what causes this spool to move up and down and open and close the different windows and blend the temperature. Amazing. That's something that simple, which is basically wax inside a, a sealed um, capsule can do that. Now to do that properly, it needs to have a good temperature sensing ability and it needs to be clean and it needs to be able to move freely inside of all these O-rings. And here's an example, one that I took apart um, recently on my shop here. And here's a brand new one. This is from a different type of valve, but it's the same type of a heat motor, let's call it heat pill, different uh, terms for this type of thing. But notice how this is already starting to get a little bit of a lime scale on the outside of that copper. Well, as we start scaling up that little um, copper capsule, it's not going to get a good temperature sense because it's better to sense copper against the water, water against the copper as opposed to a scale layer. So as this valve starts to scale up and get a lime uh, deposit, not only on this heat motor, but also on these little uh, O-rings and stuff like that, now the valve has a hard time working freely and it's going to start to jump. It'll be right at where it should be, then it'll jump a little bit up, jump a little bit down. You got your hand under a faucet and the water's warm, then it's cold, then it's hot, and then it's warm, then it's just right. That's what's happening. You've got to take that valve apart and uh, or take that valve and delime it, replace the, the guts, or sometimes just replace the valve is the easiest option and uh, take it back and uh, service it. So that's the concept behind a thermostatic mixing valve. It's the temperature across the um, the little heat motor that's moving the, the shuttle, the cartridge in there opens and closes the window. So 
<clears throat> uh, okay, I talked about that a little bit. So I want to show you how you can use this number and how you can um, uh, see what's going on inside of a, a valve, any valve. It's not just a mixing valve. So here's a little uh, spreadsheet that we put together. If, if you want this, let me know and I'll, I'll send you a copy of this. It's just an Excel sheet. So there's three different um, boxes here and let's use this one over here. So let's say you've got a valve and you know what the CV is. You just bought this valve and it says right on the box or maybe right on the valve itself, it's a three CV valve. And you're gonna take that valve and you're gonna put it on a home and you know that at peak load in this building, you could have an eight gallon minute flow. If somebody's in the shower, if somebody's washing the, the dishes, if the washing machine's running, maybe the, uh, the hand sink is running, you calculated that your maximum draw on that building could be eight gallons a minute. So there's your flow rate. You put a 3C to the number of the valve, you put the flow rate in, and there's your pressure drop. So that's how much pressure drop you're gonna take across that valve as you flow eight gallons a minute through a 3C valve. Is that okay? Is that acceptable? Well, here's a couple things to look at. So let's look at the PSI first. So let's say I've got a building that has uh, 45 pounds of pressure, um, a PRV set of 45 pounds of pressure. Know that when you're running eight gallons a minute through that valve, you're gonna lose 7.11 PSI pressure through that valve. Is that acceptable? Probably, I think you could probably get away with that, especially if you've got 45 to 65 uh, pound, or 60 pounds of pressure coming into it. That's probably gonna uh, not be too noticeable when somebody's in the shower and said, all of a sudden my flow starts dropping down when I'm uh, running a lot of hot water. This is a little bit more tricky um, down here. If I've got a pump through this valve, if I'm gonna use this on a closed loop hydronic system and I need a circulator to move that eight gallons a minute through this, just this valve now, just the pressure drop through the valve, I'm gonna to have to choose a circulator that can develop that kind of head to be overcome the resistance of flow through that valve and an eight gallon per minute flow. So you can see we're getting up there. That's, uh, that's getting out of the comfort range of some of the smallest, uh, uh, typical little wet, wet rotor circulators that we might apply. So what that's going to mean is you're going to get a call on the coldest day of the year and people are going to say, you know what, we can't get our house over 60 degrees, something's wrong, you got to come over. And what you're going to find when all the zone valves are open and it's demanding an eight gallon a minute flow, if you haven't sized that circulator to overcome that pressure drop, that valve is going to start um, restricting the flow and you're going to have a, a loss of heat or a low heat call probably. So that's where you really want to pay attention when you start using a low CV valve and you try to jam a lot of flow through it, so certainly with a circulator pump. Quickly on the other ones you can find, if you have any two numbers, you can solve for the third one. It's just a mathematical equation. So let's say I've got gauges on both sides of my valve and I know what the pressure drop is across that valve when I'm flowing um, through it. And if I know the CV of the valve, I found the, the sticker on it, or I found the label on the uh, box or something like that, I know I've got a three gallon a minute flow going through it, got seven pounds of pressure. Um, I've got a CV of three, I've got seven pounds of pressure drop, excuse me if I got that right. I know that I'm moving eight gallons a minute through that valve. So I could troubleshoot with this. If I had these two numbers, I could say, well, I've got eight gallons a minute going out to that zone. Uh, if my load calls for 10 gallons a minute, not making them, I'm getting there. Same thing over here, if I knew the pressure drop going through the valve and if I had a flow setter on it, that I could like a quick setter with a great valve for that, and I could identify that I've got eight gallons a minute through it, I could define what that valve is. Let's say I've got a valve that I don't know what the CV is, I gotta replace it or I wanna replace it, what valve should I replace it with? That's how you can do the calculation. So uh, let me know if that can help you and I can certainly uh, share that with you. <laughs> so here's where you wanna be careful. So I went out and I started looking around at some of the other valves on the market out there and started pulling up some spec sheets just to see what the, uh, the competitors basically are doing out there. And this one here, I wanna be careful with this number right here. So here's a valve, uh, it was a three quarter valve and it shows a CV of 2.3. That's a lower CV obviously than a three. And right under it, it says maximum flow 20 gallons per minute. And so what somebody might do is go to a supplier, somebody that doesn't understand all this relationship here and say, well, I've got a job, I, I need to move 20 gallons a minute through my radiant loop, uh, will this valve work? And he's gonna open the sheet and said, oh yeah, it's got a max flow rate of 20 gallons per minute. Now I will say there is a little note under here and this is important that you know the tube size has something to do with how many gallons per minute you can move. Try moving 20 gallons a minute through a three quarter copper pipe and uh, this is what's gonna happen. So let's just take that number uh, 2.3 and put in the maximum flow that's shown right here on that list and see what happens. So there's your pressure drop going through that valve at a 20 gallon a minute flow rate through a 2.3 CV valve. You know what, if you've got 60 pounds of water pressure coming into your house, where are you gonna get with a 75 pound pressure drop across that valve? Or if you wanna use that as a mixing valve and you got size a circulator for that, try and find a circulator moving 20 gallons a minute at 174 feet ahead. 
So that's where you want to be careful. When you ever see a valve with a low CV number, just beware that there's going to be some limitations. Could I get there? If I've got enough horsepower, if I've got enough force to drive this condition right here, yeah, I could get 20 gallons per minute. I'm probably going to be a pretty noisy valve with those conditions. 20 gallons a minute, three-quarter copper tube, if that's what that was piped with, 14 feet per second velocity. You know, We typically recommend four to five feet per second velocity maximum. Uh, going through a pipe, so 10 mile per hour, that's not a very doable um, thing. So just know what these numbers mean. Hopefully after tonight, you have a good understanding of both the temperature differential as well as the um, what the CV number means and how it would be applied. All right, so let's go. So two things can happen, two things that do happen to a thermostatic valve when you use it in domestic water, <clears throat> excuse me, applications, and you've got to put a um, recirculation system on it. So probably the best place to start is this little graphic right down here, because this is what's going to happen when a valve is applied like this. So let's say this circulator is running 24-7, which some of the codes now are starting to um, demand that you run this all the time just for Legionella protection in this loop, so you don't have any dead loops here, dead end loops here. So let's say that valve is, uh, this pump is running 24-7, just recirculating through this loop. So what we want to happen is we want hot water coming in. Let's say we've got 140 degree water coming in from my um, water heater, and I've got city water coming in at, I don't know, pick a number, 60 degrees coming in from my uh, city water supply. I can blend that 60 with my 140 and get down to, let's call this 120 degrees, and that's going to be fine. So what's going to happen if you've got a period of time where nobody opens a faucet in that building, maybe through the nighttime on a uh, residence, certainly, or even a, a hotel where everybody's sleeping at night, nobody's drawing any hot water. What's going to happen at a certain point, that water coming back now is at, let's say, 115 degrees, maybe leaving that valve at 120, dropping five degrees as it goes around the loop, coming back at 115 degrees. I'm starting to put warm water on the cold port of my valve. And what's going to happen is this outlet temperature now is going to start to creep up because there's no cold water until somebody opens the faucet, the hot water faucet in this building. No cold water can come into that valve to blend with the hot water to get me back down to the temperature here. And over a period of time, depending on this loop, depending on that pump, uh, depending on the conditions in that loop, that temperature coming out of this mixing valve is going to creep up to the same temperature that's coming in the hot port of it. And this is what it looks like right here. I got cold, I got hot, I'm mixing accurately. I'm getting a little bit warmer here, but still got enough resolution, still got that 27 degree differential, still blending pretty accurately. Now I'm starting to get warm here instead of cold. So now I've got warm, I've got hot, and you can see my temperature here is starting to slip away. It's starting to increase. I kind of show that by the color of the arrow, by the way. So after a period of time, I've got hot coming into my cold port. I've got hot coming into my um, hot port, and my temperature mixing out is the exact same temperature as coming into it. You're going to send this valve back to us and say your valve doesn't work. There's something wrong with your valve. It doesn't regulate. It just the temperature creeps up after a period of time. It's not the valve. It's the condition that you put it under. Another thing that can happen with a valve is the exact opposite time uh, condition can happen where the temperature can droop. If I don't have enough temperature going in this valve to maintain what's being lost as I go around this loop, now this temperature can drop down, and now I've got um, a drooping temperature lower than what the valve is set for. So one of those two conditions can happen, and there's a couple different ways you can solve that quickly and easily. Uh, electrically, you could put a, suppose, a, uh, a set point controller on this and just have the pump turn on and off. Uh, turn it off when the loop is warm. No sense pumping if the loop is warm. Then you won't be getting hot going into the, um, the uh, cold port of the valve. I could put a timer on that pump, shut it off at a certain uh, point in time. I could pulse it on and off every 15 minutes, and those are fixes that are out there. That would work. There's a mechanical fix for that, and it shows right here a bypass valve. Really what I want to happen in this, this, think of this as a hydronic loop, and I want just enough flow, just enough GPM going around this loop here to offcome the temperature drop in that loop. If I've got that set exactly right, I'm not going to droop, I'm not going to creep. And the way I would do that is put a valve here that I could slowly adjust and regulate. So some of the flow is going to go around the loop. The rest of the output of that pump is going to go right back into the hot water tank. I don't need it in my loop anymore. So you could do this a number of ways. You could put a temperature gauge here, set that at a certain uh, a temperature, let's say 120 degrees with nobody using water in the building. Put another gauge here, put your hand on the return pipe, and just adjust this valve until you have a five degree temperature drop going around that loop. Three to five degrees is a fairly typical uh, temperature drop going around the loop here. Um, I wanted you to use a valve that you can adjust uh, accurately, make a slow correction to that flow right there. One of the cluffy quick setters would be good. Uh, really any uh, good quality balancing valve, you could uh, balance that out. 
And so that's going to solve both the problems. So if you see a job where you've got a recirculation pump and you see a thermostatic mixing valve, make sure there's a mechanism in play to regulate the temperature of that loop. This is one way that you could add this uh, bypass loop and adjust it properly, or some of the smart pumps would might have the logic to be able to watch that and regulate that. I learned that years ago, there was actually, well, here it is right here. There was an article in 2004 issue of a, uh, a magazine, I believe it was Plumbing Mechanical Magazine, written by Julius Blanco, and he had explained this. And uh, I was working as a plumber back in these days, and when I went to work at Cleppe in uh, 2008, I think it was, uh, this started coming up quite a bit. You know, people were sending back valves. I go back to the return section. I see all these thermostatic mixing valves. We'll take some of them. We'll take it to the test bench. The valve works fine. Why are all these valves coming back? And I remembered this article, and I called you this one day, and I said, I remember you explaining this whole thing about this balancing port. Uh, would you come and explain that and do a webinar? And he said, sure, I'd love to. And so there it is. It's a, I think it's probably one of our most, if not our most viewed uh, on our YouTube channel of all the different uh, Coffee with Cleppy webinars that we've done over the years, over it was like over 44,000 views when I looked at it this morning, which made me think probably a lot of people are having this problem with the thermostatic valve and didn't understand um, why it's happening and what they can do about it. So there's a couple sources if you wanna look up this article, learn a little bit more about where the check valves go and stuff like that. We also covered it in an hydronics issue, in fact, a couple different hydronics issues. And uh, Julius came and did a, a really nice uh, Coffee with Cluffy uh, presentation for us on that. So what am I doing here? Yikes, got to keep moving. <clears throat> this is another valve that we make. This is a new valve to the Cluffy lineup. It's called our 520 angle mix. And something kind of, a couple of unique things about this valve. Number one, you can see the pattern of it makes it nice. You screw it right on the top of your water heater. Uh, you can just go straight out to your load. So you don't have to put an elbow or a, a fitting there to make the uh, correction to go up. It also has a unique cartridge. It's got a very fast responding cartridge and it also does something very unique is that it can shut off the port 100%. So what would happen if you lose, let's say the cold water coming in this valve, it will shut off that you don't get a scalding condition. We don't call it a scald valve per se, but know that this, and you can see one of the reasons why they can respond. You can see a much bigger uh, heat motor that was built inside that valve. And also, I don't know if you paid attention to how the other valve was built in here, how the two cartridges interact with one another to open and close these ports. So great valve available in a lot of different configurations and a temperature gauge. So if you are, Number one, setting the temperature, or if you do want to balance a um, recirculation loop with it, you've got the gauge. You don't need to put a bypass in with this valve. This valve will adjust properly and respond quick enough that you won't have that temperature droop or um, overshoot condition. So next time you buy a valve, consider the, uh, the 520 valve. <clears throat> Another new entry um, that we have, one of the I think the only valve out there in a four port configuration, we call this an H valve uh, that has the NSF 61 listing on it for domestic water application. So this is a valve that's gonna be um, used right under a sink, right at the point of use on the valve. And why this valve, you're gonna start seeing a lot of these, you wanna learn about this valve, learn about the application. As we start raising the temperature of our buildings, when we open buildings that might have a potential of a bacteria growing in them, we might send 140 degrees out to that building. We wanna make sure if somebody opens a faucet in that building, when that uh, valve is allowing 140 degrees out to that building, that you've got protection at every single connection into the hot water in that building. And this is the type of valve that you could use to give you that final protection right at the sink, right at the um, uh, bidet, whatever it might be that is hot and cold water that you wanna make sure that you don't get a blast of uh, a certainly 140 degree water. Uh, it's available with all these compression nuts. Uh, there's a cap for one port, because if you have a single handle valve, like you'll see in a lot of uh, commercial restrooms now, where you just stick your hand under it and there's no handles at all, uh, obviously you'd want to uh, cap off the uh, cold port there and just have the mixed temperature going up to that valve. So inside, uh, very similar to what you see on the other valves, it will have the two check valves included with it. Critical that this have uh, check protection when you install it at point of um, use like that. Notice too, there's little strainers in here, and this is gonna be a serviceable item. If you've got uh, dirt or silica or crap in your water, you're gonna have to make sure that those uh, little strainers in there get serviced from time to time. It's easy, we've got a um, connection right there that you can take that apart, or on the compression nut on this connection uh, to get in there and service that valve. It's gonna have a really low CV because it's gonna work at a very, uh, down to a 0.25 uh, GPM flow rate. 
I don't know how well you can see the picture. This is an example of what a system might look like in the in the common day and age where we've got a valve that's doing our central mixing. This is a Legionella protection valve that I can elevate the temperature by putting the motor on it. And then if you can see in the picture, I've got mixing out at my shower head. I've got mixing at my shower valve, probably built into it. I've got mixing under my hand sinks. Wherever I've got a connection into that uh, hot water, you better have a, a point of uh, use, which would be an ASE. ASSE 1070 will be the listing on that valve to be used in this application here um, as a point of use valve. All right, so I mean, going to be honest with you, this is going to be a valve that's going to require some maintenance, and here's a, an example why that is. Excuse me. This is a valve that, um, <clears throat> yep. Um, was in a domestic water application, and it's a pretty ugly valve. In fact, one of them that came into the returns uh, a bench that I took a picture of, uh, pretty sure the valve didn't leave the factory looking like that. So that valve uh, is um, probably not responding properly. It needs to be cleaned out. So what I want to do is I'm going to show you a way that you can clean these valves pretty simply and quickly. That's my little demo for today, which I, I better do that and then come back to some of these slides. And so what I want to do is I want to get this out of the valve, this uh, debris, whatever it might be, hard water, looks like some iron in that water probably because of the red color. I probably got some calcium and different uh, magnesium typical you know hardness that's in water but i also want to get this little heat motor cleaned off that's down inside this valve so i get a good temperature response i want it to look like this so that when the water touches it it's not going through a layer of insulation i got to go through that and why this is going to happen is there's a pipe that actually came out of a job <clears throat> that's how much lime scale has been built up in that valve over the years so obviously the flow rate of that pipe is dropping off but that's going to be inside your valve also so let me see um let me see what my next slide is first, and then maybe what I'm going to do is um, um, let me do one more, and then we're going to go to the demo. Then we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about the the scaling and the deliming. So what I wanted to show you in this one is going back again to if you want to apply this valve on a um, a radiant system, paying attention to the um, the CV and the the pressure drop through that valve. So here I'm showing a typical application. So on a domestic water system, I've got pressure to drive the pressure drop through that valve. I've got my 45, 60, whatever water pressure you have in your building is able to overcome that pressure drop through that valve. When I start applying the valve this way, what has to overcome the pressure drop in that valve is this circulator pump right here. So that's why this chart, the CV number comes into play. If I want a job, let's say I've got five loops here and I want 10 gallons per minute going through that, I chose a three CV valve, there's your problem, Vern. You got to make sure that that circulator can have that kind of a, can overcome that kind of pressure drop through that valve. Kind of goes back to that CV chart I showed you a little bit earlier. So let me see, Mary, if I can. Uh, yeah, I think I want to do my demo now. So let me uh, um, close out the show here, right? Mm -hmm. Or exit. Just that. Well, let me go. I got my. Uh, Boy, if you're helping me with this, and I'm going to go down to a little video I filmed here and show you. This is a quick one here, but um, <clears throat> I can set it up a little bit. Basically, I wanted to come up with a way that you could quickly and easily clean out a thermostatic mixing valve. We don't like to see taking these uh, you taking these valves apart on the job site anymore. There's just too many things that can go wrong. Uh, in fact, I'll show you one here in a second, what happens when you take them apart with the spring and all the things like that. So either you can replace the whole body on the valve, keep the connections, or here's another option. You can take that valve home and Basically what I did is I just took a tankless water heater a kit and I put a Y hose on the valve. If you stack two garden hose uh, washers on this, when you put it on there, you can actually thread that onto an NPT connection. And I just hooked this down to the pump that's in the bucket here uh, on here and I just flow through this valve. So I'm pumping into the hose here through the two ports of the valve and out the other thing, put a little bit of the acid or the um, vinegar, whatever you'd like to use for delime and, and just let this run. So let me just show you this and then uh, we'll talk about it. Well, how can I make that simple so I don't have to take it apart and so I can put it together? So, go back to the start here. Sorry about that. All right, so here's an idea I had. Knowing that this type of valve is going to need an occasional cleaning and typically a vinegar or some of the different descaling gases like this haymaker kit that we use for tankless water heater could be used. So I said, well, how can I make that simple so I don't have to take it apart and so I can put it together? So I just got a regular Y hose from the hardware store, basically two garden hose washers under this and you can make a connection, drill some holes in the bucket and just kind of stuck that valve right on the lid. And so now what you do is you get your setup in there, you get your juice in there, your acid, your vinegar, whatever you want to use. And if you plug it in, 
basically what it's going to do, it's just going to circulate through both the ports of the valve and out the mix port, and you'll let this thing run for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how badly scaled your valve is, and you come back and unhook it, and you're ready to go. No disassembly needed. Uh, it can be a 15-minute uh, repair job for a mixing valve. All right, so here we are with hot dogs and hot topics. So basically what I've done here is I've just gotten some parts, a couple flex hoses, a compression T hose adapter, and a female to compression adapter. And basically what I've done is I've just taken my pump now and connected it to two hot and cold input ports to this H valve, uh, put my vinegar in the bucket here, and now I'm just circulating through this valve. So I'm going to D-line, descale this valve uh, without disassembling it, without taking it apart, just run it on this bucket, maybe just set it for that uh, 20, 15 minutes, whatever it takes to descale this valve. So it's just a quick, simple way of doing that instead of replacing and rebuilding these valves is just run a fluid through them and clean them out. All right, what do you think of that idea? So, you know, if you're in an application where you see a lot of these valves and you know that you have to um, service them, you might uh, have an extra one on your truck, take the one out, take it back to your shop when you have time, uh, de -lime it and stuff like that. Because, you know, usually um, these can be salvaged if they're limed up. Occasionally you'll get one where maybe there's an O-ring ripped or something here, but as long as you're not taking it apart or something sharp's not getting in there, most of the time they can be uh, just cleaned out. So there's applications that we know of where there's actually crews go around on this one resort property that we know of, and that's all they do all day is they just go around this big um, uh, resort and uh, just clean out mixing valves. That's just their job is just maintaining these valves. So think of a hotel with a thousand rooms and you've got one of these under every sink in that building. Uh, you might have a big central mixer back there. So um, yeah, so here what I'm showing is a larger size valve. So we can go into larger size valves. We can get you a two inch thermostatic mixing valve and just know that when you get in these larger valves, obviously you've got um, a less pressure drop going through it, but you're going to have some different minimum flow rates on that valve to respond accurately. So uh, on the smaller valves, we can respond down to one GPM in flow. As you start getting to this bigger valve, you're going to need a, a more minimum flow rate. And the reason for that is as this chamber, as this um, space in here gets larger. What has to happen on these thermostatic mixing valves? I have to have a really good turbulent condition around that little wax cartridge that's in there. I had a little cutaway one here. If I only had a slow flow rate, let's say I've only had uh, one gallon a minute going through a big valve like this, and what's going to happen, that flow is going to come in these, and I'm just going to have a little bit of flow going down the outside of this um, wax cartridge. I don't have enough uh, movement or turbulent conditions around that for that wax to respond and to move that uh, cartridge up and down accurately. And that's where we run into problems is we start to put larger valves in and we try to regulate those down at a low flow rate, you know, try and get a half a gallon a minute through a two inch thermostatic mixing valve. It, it's not going to go there for you. It's just not the, um, it's not going to do that. So with that in mind, if you have an application, and you do, and you will, it's going to be a hotel, it's going to be an apartment building, even a big residential building, you might have an application where they've got uh, uh, body sprays or they've got a Roman tub filler that's 20 gallons per minute or something like that, not going to be able to handle that with just a, a small 3CV valve. So what you can do is, and we sell this as a kit just or a package assembled just as you see it here, you can put two valves, thermostatic valves in parallel. And to take it a step further, what we do at Kalefi, we make it even better than that, is we'll put two valves in parallel and we'll put a pressure reducing valve in between that. And so here's what's going to happen. And this is actually the setup um, instructions on how you set this up when you first put this valve in, but it kind of shows the flow path pretty nicely. So if I've got a low flow condition, what's going to happen is the hot and cold is going to come <clears throat> through this small, what's called a three-quarter mixing valve here, and it's going to go out and you're going to get good accurate flow going out to the, the job at a low flow rate. That's called the 2 GPM flow rate. What will happen is I start flowing through this valve and it starts to see a pressure drop when I start getting up at maybe 6, 8, 10 GPM, whatever it is, and saying, ooh, I'm having a hard time keeping up. You're going to see a drop in pressure going through there. The pressure reducing valve is going to sense that and it's going to open a port and it's going to allow some of the flow to go through the larger valve. It's going to keep going through the small valve, but now it's going to allow some flow to go through there so it can get back to where I have enough um, flow going through the valves to overcome the pressure drop. This small valve can't go there. Now I'm going to go through my big valves. And that's probably going to happen maybe somewhere around the um, five gallon per minute range or something like that. You can adjust these valves. You can set the um, 
of the pressure where that uh, changeover occurs. But that's what you want to do is you want this valve to handle your low flow, your single faucet uh, flow conditions. You want this valve to handle when everybody in the building is taking a shower, you've got maybe a 20, 40, 60 gallon per minute flow rate. So that's how you can get around that issue of having a valve that's going to be accurate to low flow condition. You got a big uh, valve here that can handle your high flow condition, just put them in parallel. Uh, you could build this yourself on a job site if you wanted to get the two valves, your small valve, your bigger valve. Uh, well, if you go to our website, it explains how to set up the uh, the pressure reducing valve there, so they make the the switch over when the small valve can't keep up anymore. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So I think everybody got what was going on there. In fact, there's one of the valves that I put on there that was scaled up. You can see this one had a little bit of leak there, so that's an indication of the scale right there. When you walk up to a valve, you see some white or green on there, you know there's scale inside that valve, it's on the inside where there was a little leak in the washer or something on that valve. So um, that's basically what I did is just drilled a couple holes on the top of that lid and just um, uh, put on that valve. You know what, It cannot, you can do that in 15 or 20 minutes. Even a hydronic valve, here's a valve right here. Uh, I can hold that up where you can see that. That one's not in really bad shape. This one doesn't have a lot of white in it because it was a closed loop hydronic system but it's sticking. In fact, this was my valve. I took it out. You can see the same thing there. A couple tips on this valve. If you do get tempted to take one of these apart, know that there's a spring in there that's going to try and shoot that valve apart. The other thing I would say when you go to reassemble this valve, you got to pay attention to the, the, where all the parts go in that valve. And you know what? It's easier to put them together upside down like this so you don't lose any of those parts when you put it in there. Just put that in there, engage the spring, and tighten it up. So um, again, don't like to see them come apart. There is a tendency to start ripping those O-rings if you start yanking those apart, especially if they're seized up and they've got some lime scale in there, you pull it apart and now you've got a damaged O-ring and you're starting over. Uh, you're not gonna be able to salvage that on the job site if you um, if you rip it. We make it easy, we sell just the body. You know, If you wanna just keep a spare body on your truck and just switch it out with the unions and a, a couple new uh, fiber washers and there where you go. If you're going to do H valve descaling, here's all I did is I bought a couple of 3 8 by 3 8 compression hoses at the hardware store, compression T, and adapt it to a, a male hose thread here. You just hook these on, you go to both sides of the, the hot and cold on your H valve, hook that up to the hose on my little um, D line bucket pump, and uh, away you go. So, uh, just a little picture of it there. I know too that there's pretty small. What I do is when, if I was in front of you in person, I would pass this around, let everybody see it and stuff. But there's the uh, a cutaway. We just have a, a machine shop cut these valves away so we can uh, show people, pass them around the room and show you <laughs> in front of a screen. Know that there's a couple of really small strainers in there. It doesn't take a lot. If you've got dirty water, you've got a lot of silica sand or something in your well, um, you're going to have to get in there and uh, serve those strainers from time to time and possibly delime the valve if you start getting the, the scale buildup in there. All right, let me get down. I know we've got another uh, trivia question here. Yeah, I knew I was going to run out of time uh, getting in the motorized mixing valves. We'll come back to this topic. Uh, there's ball type mixing valves. That's what we're using on our new Legio mix valve. That's a really unique valve in the industry. There's cylinder type of mixing valves, plunger type, vein type. This is an old Tecmar. Uh, some of you guys that did radiant with these old four uh, port. Um, a vein type of mixing valves that's a little scarecrow out in the garden now. Uh, the beauty of that is now once I put a motor, an actuator on a valve, I can do a lot of things with it. Now I've got a computer that can record things, it can data log, it can send me messages. Um, it's kind of the where we're going with mixing valves is a digital electronic type of mixing valve as opposed to a thermostatic cartridge. Some people saw, uh, call the thermostatic mixing valve the rotary phone of valves. Yeah, maybe that's a good analogy. It certainly um, is that type of technology, but they work. I mean, just like a rotary phone would work, I guess, if you still had one. So I'm going to uh, do another, another trivia uh, question here for a uh, copy of Pumping Away. Thanks to Aaron and uh, Dan for donating a book for this one here. All right, who knows what this uh, acronym here, uh, November Papa Sierra Hotel, what that stands for in hydronic uh, technology? Oh. You there? I blew it. There's the answer. I guess I was supposed to say that I should have, uh, sorry about that, I should have uh, animated this one. There it is. <laughs> sorry, Aaron. How are we going to give away a book? Maybe we'll have to quickly think of another. Uh, tell me the other one that you had, Aaron, about the, um, yeah. the radio. Oh, it, no, it. Hot Rod. So the question is actually, so NP, those of who are technical know that NPSH stands for net positive suction head as it applies to pumps. 
but what did the legendary Gil Carlson say that the acronym NPSH really stands for? You saved me. That was a, <laughs> that was a lifeline. So that's, that's the question we're asking. What did Gil Carlson, uh, uh, was another way that he uh, used those initials. So if somebody knows what Gil called the NPSH instead of a net positive suction head. So I guess I should have paid a little more attention to that. Sorry. So yeah, so we still have a giveaway for that. That one should be, uh, I think that's going to be fairly easy. We'll give you a minute to think about that. Let me see what I've got next. I don't think the answer is next, but let me, uh, yeah. Well, Bob, if I can interrupt, you're right. It's the, the answers are flinging across here. Now, I will ask Aaron. We have a Sean McGovern uh, who says, not pumping so hot is the acronym NPSH. How's that sound? Yes, that is correct. Congratulations, Sean. What a prankster that Gil was, huh? All right, so that's our uh, that's our giveaway. We'll make sure that you get a, a copy of Pumping Away. And what do we have for questions, Mark or Kevin or anybody that's been watching them? I didn't, uh, I kind of rolled kind of quickly here through the uh, material, but certainly anybody that has a question or if any were typed in or something, uh, let me have them. <clears throat> I think I covered the pre-submitted ones. That's why I kind of got a little long on this. Uh, there was a, a 20 or 30 pre-submitted questions before we started this, and I tried to build them into the presentation as I want. I know Terry Campbell, one of our reps, wanted me to talk about check valves because that's a common uh, mistake that he sees. So I, I added some slides, and I got a little uh, a long in the tooth here on the uh, on the presentation. Sorry about that. But do you have anything, Kevin, or were you covering them for me as we went through here? Or Mary, I would think right? you answered them all, Bob, uh, or we've been answering them as we go. Thank you. Bob, there was a question on uh, cleaning the valve. Um, 15, 20 minutes, is that realistic or is it, what, is it, what does it depend on? Yeah, I mean, if you have a valve where you can't even see in the opening and we've had them come back like that, that looked like they're full of concrete instead of water. Yeah, that one's probably not going to be salvageable. And if it is, it's going to take a longer time. Most of the time you're going to get them when they're kind of working, you know, so if, if you can get any flow through them, I found that, um, especially the tankless water heater kits where it's an acid, I think that's a little bit stronger than the um, the vinegar maybe. But um yeah, I mean, 20 minutes, you know, is realistic. It, it really depends on how badly they're scaled. And so here's what happens on a thermostatic mixing valve since we're talking about scale. A couple things that cause scale to come out of solution in water is the temperature. And what's starting to happen, what's going to happen more, as people crank up their water heater temperatures to either extend their hot water or they're worried about Legionella growing in their water heater at low temperatures, say 120, setting their water heaters up. The higher the temperature, the more the minerals are going to precipitate out of that water and the more they're going to get into your mixing valves and going to start uh, uh, scaling up in that mixing valve. So a lot has to do with, number one, the hardness of the water that you're putting through the valve the temperature of the water that you're putting through that and how many gallons you're putting through that valve. I mean, if it's a, you know, a retired couple and they only use 10, 20 gallons of hot water a day, you know, that valve might go years before it needs any work. If you've got a family of four and they're taking, uh, you know, body spray showers or something like that and running uh, 80 gallons of hot water a day through the valve, then obviously that valve is going to uh, need more attention. But um, yeah, just know that that's uh, the indication is the valve's not responding accurately, that it needs to be, um, uh, descaled or replaced, rebuilt. So thanks for that question. Another question was on the temperature creep. Are you going to see that typically happen more in a residential application or or commercial application? I think it's more noticeable in residential. And what I think happens, um, I think people that starts happening maybe in homes and people just assume that that's the way it's going to be or that it should be and they'll get used to that and they'll say, hey, be careful when you get up first one in the morning and you open that hot water, let it run for a minute, it's going to be hot. And I think people don't understand that that valve shouldn't be doing that. And I think there's some plumbers out there probably don't understand that that valve shouldn't be creeping like that. It should be stable all the time. So I would think people probably get used to that. In a hotel, and I've been in hotels where I get in the shower and I got hot and I got cold and I got hot. Uh, I know better. I know what's going on there. Either the tankless aren't behaving properly or they've got a mixing valve that's misbehaving. You're probably going to get more complaints in a, in a building like that where people uh, don't want that or aren't used to that, uh, that temperature moving around like that. And that would be, should be an indication to that um, building main, uh, maintenance team that that valve uh, uh, needs some attention. 
And it could be six months into the job that that happens. If you got, I've been in a place in Canada where the water's 30 grains hard. I'm not how, sure how it even comes out of the pipe or the faucet with that much, uh, uh, that hardness number and that many minerals in the water. But can you imagine a valve under those type of uh, applications? That's going to be a tough go for a, a valve with a lot of small openings. And that would be true of any valve. I mean, your mixing valve on your shower. I mean, any valve that's in that, it's going to have the same condition. Another thing that I learned just recently, I was out in Oklahoma here a couple of weeks ago visiting some uh, supply houses out there. And one of the suppliers said, we're getting a lot more water here warranties these days. And I said, well, that's odd because I think people are cranking up, especially in the COVID times we live in and Legionella and all the other things out there. People are seeing this information. You got to get your temperature up over 130, 140 degrees to kill bacteria in a short period of time. So people are saying, well, I don't want that happening. So they're cranking their water heaters up and it shortens the life of the water heater considerably. Uh, according to this one supplier said we're getting tanks back that are only three years old and they've uh, they've gone bad from uh, you know that elevated temperature just know that that you know the temperature affects not only the uh, the mineral precipitation in our valves but also in the water heater itself and then of course it overheats and uh, pins hole through the metal because there's so much sediment in the bottom of the tank so just another thing to know when you start cranking water heaters temperature up well, what do you, where do you think this is going to go, Bob? The conflict between codes that are uh, stressing energy savings, you know, um, you know, a temperature sensor, uh, an aquastat on your recirculating line, and then uh, from a bacterial safety standpoint, where it's advocated, ASHRAE 188 as an example, continuous circulation. Do you think is there any thought of who's, what, where is that going to end up going? That's a good question. I mean, we're going to be a player in it for sure. I can tell you whatever happens, we're going to have a component to, to help you with those issues. But yeah, there's actually kind of a catch-22 right now. You know, for a while there, they were saying, well, don't run your recirculation pump unless you absolutely have to because you're wasting electricity. So right now in California, if anybody's on here from California, the energy code there says that um, uh, the recirculation lines need to have one inch of pipe insulation on them. So the pipe insulation is almost more than the copper pipe, but they want them. I think the OSHA, Kevin can pipe in. I know he follows this pretty closely. I think the OSHA standard said those pumps need to run 24 seven to assure that those pipes are always, um, you know, at an elevated temperature. If that's the case, and if that's what you or your customer decides they want, you better have these point of use little H valves scattered throughout that building because that's, you don't want to open a faucet at 140 degrees because you're going to have a, uh, phone call and it might be from an attorney that you don't want to be hearing from. So that's where the, that's why I brought that age pattern kind of into the discussion tonight. We see a huge market developing for that because we've got to have that point of use protection if we're going to elevate that temperature. And even if you don't elevate that temperature and run it at that all the time, even if you elevate it at a period of time, uh, like some of the codes are tar starting to tell us to do now for say a one hour period of time, at that one hour period of time, every faucet in that building is going to have a potential to see that 140 degrees. That's why we're going to have to have that point of uh, uh, use protection valve in addition to the, the central mixing valve back at the um, uh, at the water heater, whatever it is. So good news for us. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity to, number one, learn how to properly apply and pipe this like I showed you in the, uh, in the diagrams there, but also how to apply the, you know, the correct valve and the correct application, point of use valve, the point of uh, distribution valve. So, Jumping to hydronics, another question, Bob, um, uh, pumping away. Does the topic or the concept of pumping away also apply when you're using thermostatic mixing valve in a hydronic system? Yeah, and that's a great question. You always want to pump away from the mix port. And I've seen this, in fact, I saw one on a, a social media post today where somebody was really proud of his piping, had the pump pumping into the hot port of the valve. And I'm going to politely, you know, private message them and say, yeah, you really need to, what we want to do is we want to pump away from the hot port. So we pull the hot and cold and evenly through the two ports. That's why we pump away from the hot port or the mix port, I should say, of a three port mixing valve. So we're equally pulling through the same side. Yeah, the flow is going to go through properly if you pump into one of the side ports, the pump into the hot port, for example, off of maybe a primary secondary loop. You're thinking you want to pump uh, the hot water out of that uh, primary uh, loop into the hot port of the valve. No, you want to pull through the valve evenly through the, uh, the hot and cold port for that valve to, to respond and mix properly. If you don't if you don't pump away and you're pumping into one of the ports, say the hot, like you mentioned, what yeah. type of what would you see as a symptom in your hydronic system? 
well, you won't get a proper mixing. And also, if you've got delta P being developed by the pump and you don't have your check valve in there, you could be pushing some of that hot back into the cold port because you got a little bit more pressure there than you do on the cold port, possibly, depending on how it's piped and that. So you could have your uh, cross connection there. So then you've got a really funky blend of temperature going on if you're pushing some of your hot and your cold and you're not getting enough pulled through the hot and cold to blend going out the mix port. So um, I'll put a gauge on that someday just to play around with that, maybe on one of our demos that we're doing here and just maybe show that on a, a Instagram post or something someday, The uh, what exactly happens when that scenario uh, is in play where you're pumping into the port instead of away from the mix port. So, Other than uh, receiving valves back with uh, scaled up um, insides and you showed us a solution where you can take them apart and or you can just but I'll delimer through them. Um, are there are there things to stay away from from an application standpoint, whether hydronic or plumbing, that seems to crop up as common problems? Any well, any top one or two that you see commonly? Yeah, I mean the most common is obviously the wrong valve for the flow rate that you really require. You know, you've got too low of a CV valve for a high flow rate. Or you've got only a big valve, and we see this quite a bit. People buy and say, "Well, I've got a you know a 40 gallon per minute uh, load on this building. I need an inch and a half, or whatever the valve might be." And they put in just that valve, and now when they try and open just a small sink or something like that, they don't have any uh, they don't have accurate temperature regulation. So I would say the two of them, one of the two extremes, either they undersize the valve, not understanding that they've got that pressure drop at high flow rates, or they put in an oversized valve and they don't have the resolution, they don't have the um, authority i guess is the proper word for that at a at a low flow rate so but yeah i mean uh, uh, valves coming back the most common i would say is the scaling i mean if kevin i know he's had a lot of tech support um <clears throat> experience if he's still on and has any other um things that come back maybe somebody took a valve apart and didn't get the uh the components put back in the right order or something like that they tried to salvage one on a job site and they um didn't get it back together properly or they uh, ripped an o-ring when they put it together obviously that's going to uh, affect the performance of the valve. Put the cartridge yeah. upside Certain down. Certain scale is, is the biggest one, Bob. You're right. We we, we uh, get valves back, and the the contractor will say it's only been installed for a year. Well, you could look at that valve, and it's just nasty, you know. And it's obviously a water condition issue. So that's really the big one. Uh, and your other two comments too. What we find is when when uh, someone buys the the larger five two three one and expects to be able to control it, you know, one GPM. Those will come back also, and that's an expensive proposition. Kevin, what do we see when those come back? The the contractor is telling us what? What is the homeowner or building owner telling is the symptom when an oversized valve, like a McMansion call it, and uh, they have low flow fixtures? Is it? They just say, oh, this thing doesn't work, you know, but but really when, when you get a larger valve that has a, you know, a, a maximum flow of 40 GPM, it's not going to do well at one GPM. It will hunt, so you'll get slugs of hot and cold water, and it will, will not be stable. So that's when you need to go to the high low, like Bob showed in that slide with the small and then the large, and that that will handle you know one GPM all the way up to 40 GPM. It's made for that. Yeah, there's really no way to cheat your ways out of it, guys. There's just not a way to make the two different size valves um, do the two different tasks. That's you know, again why we make different size valves, but uh, yeah, there's no way to, I had somebody call me and say, oh, can I put a big recirculation pump on it and meet the minimum flow through the valve? I said, well, we're going to put out that water that you're circulating through. He said, well, I'll make just a dummy loop right now. I said, no, just put the two valves on it. You can't you can't fool the valve. I mean, it's a, a simplistic valve, but it knows what's going on as far as flow rate and temperature, and it's going to respond accordingly. So really that uh, you, you just got to get the right valve applied. And we'll hop if you're that. sizing, Bob, Bob, if you're sizing a valve rather than based on flow, you're, you're just sizing to the pipe size. You know, you got a one-inch valve and you got a one-inch pipe. You just, you know, uh, you're matching. What are you more apt to be in a, a oversized situation with your valve or an undersized? Well, it depends on what the valve is. And we've had this valve where people, you know, they have a two-inch pipe coming in the building and they think, well, I got to get a two-inch mixing valve. Well. It's more what the you know what the what the load is on that building. The pipe could have been sized improperly. Um, in fact, in check valves here. In fact, I got one in my hand. That's a commonly misoversized valve because it sizes by the flow rate. If you don't have uh, what is that an inch and a half? I don't have 45 gallons per minute going through that valve. That window in there isn't going to open. And this valve is going to do this. It's going to chatter. 
So you might see a check valve in an application where I've got a, a one inch check valve and I've got an inch and a half or two inch pipe coming through it because that's the flow rate. That's the CV of that valve for that check to open. But I would say um, oversizing, I don't know, Kevin, maybe you can pipe in. I would think oversizing is probably more of a problem where they think, you know, I got to cover the high flow rate or people aren't going to get enough uh, water out of their shower heads or out of their faucets. They buy a valve that's oversized and they, they lose the low end uh, uh, resolution or accuracy. But um, yeah, you're right. Both ways. I mean, just from what comes back and what we see, I mean, just that, it, you know, uh, at our customers, I would think the same applies for other brands. That it would be the same issue. I mean, it doesn't uh, it doesn't change by brand by brand that that uh, condition. Now that being said, when we talk about the motorized valve, we can do a lot more with a motorized valve than we can with a uh, thermostatic valve because now I got a big uh, I've got a big opening for high flow rate, but I've got a motor that can really uh, move that valve quickly and respond to lower flow rates too. So, yeah. Well, got a few people hanging on here yet. Uh, in fact, everybody's still hanging on. If there's anything else, hi, Jason, how are you? I've uh, been going to the NTI, checking with those. Got a lot of good webinars going on from all the brands these days, folks. I know you might be getting a little weary at home and, and getting overwhelmed with webinars, but uh, the NTI team's doing a got, good job with theirs and uh, been to some B&G and some of the other folks. So uh, get the education. I have another question, um, another question coming in. Um, so with the advent or with the increased popularity of uh, instantaneous hot water heaters versus the tank type, in applying a mixing valve, are there specific things that you want to consider in that application? Yeah, that's a tough go for a mixing valve because what happens is, well, it depends on the type of um, tankless or even combi boilers. What can happen is the the way those burners modulate on some of those early and maybe some of the, even some of the new ones now, the way they modulate their burner, they can be fooled, so to speak, by the thermostatic valve and they won't get along. And so a couple things that we learned from uh, some of our reps that deal with tankless water heaters and they're in uh, states that require a thermostatic mixing valves, regardless if it's a tank, a tankless, a tankless coil, um, uh, indirect water heater, whatever it might be, they're required to put a thermostatic mixing valve. You want a valve that can respond quickly, and that 520 would be an excellent valve to use on a tankless water heater. There is kind of a workaround that I haven't tried this myself, but we've heard from some people, if you put a little bit of distance between the hot output from a, a tankless water heater or com, a combi type and give that a uh, little bit of piping dimension, obviously a tank in there would be great, but even a little bit of piping distance in there that I've got some uh, some water temperature in there that can get to the valve before the, the burner starts modulating too quickly because what happens, they'll fight one, one, one another. The valve is trying to respond at a certain speed, but the tankless water heater is ramping its output up and down, bouncing off its whatever control is telling it what to do. Uh, that can be a tough go. But what we've learned from the people that design our valves in Italy, they made a valve specifically with a fast responding cartridge, which is that bigger cartridge I showed you. I don't know if I can pull that up. And that 520 valve, that 520 valve would be a good valve to apply to a um, a tankless water here. We have to have a very quick response to, uh, to keep that uh, working. Now, that being said, and Kevin, help me with the numbers, there's been three new um, ASSC standards developed, and the tankless water heater people got together, and I believe it, and I think this is true, they said, you know what, we don't think you need a thermostatic mixing valve on our tankless water heaters because we feel that our electronics can regulate that temperature as quickly, as accurately, as the standard um, that we have a 1070, let's say, a valve, and so they uh, petitioned, uh, it was an ANSI standard, it starts out at ASSC, and they got three new um, listing numbers that say, yeah, if you have a tankless water here that meets that listing criteria, uh, you should need a thermostatic mixing valve. What I don't see is a lot of people promoting that um, on their tankless water heaters. So I don't know if they got cold feet, Kevin. I know you were involved with that standard a little bit that we're not seeing that uh, that standard coming out on some of the tankless or combi boilers out there, but it is possible that that, uh, that unit could uh, modulate as quickly and as accurately as a thermostatic mixing valve. And uh, if you could get your code officials to accept that new standard, then uh, uh, that saves you one mixing valve. I would still have your point of use valves in an application like that, you know, just to protect the, um, the end user if one of those uh, tankless water heaters loses its uh, sensor controllability, hopefully it would fail safe, but um, maybe that's Yeah, that, that's, uh, ASSE 1082 is like uh, ASSE 1017, so that's the point of distribution. Okay. Uh, so that's a standard written for uh, a, a tankless water heater as the the point of distribution control. And then ASSE 1084 is like 1070. It has to do with the point of use. 
or anti-scald. So those two standards are saying that a tankless can replace a mixing valve. So uh, I haven't seen them really being implemented. In fact, um, some of the uh, plumbing engineering magazines uh, lately, I saw an article by Ron George, which is really good. He talks about these too. So they they are out there, but I'm not seeing widely uh, specified references to those. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we know thermostatic mixing valves can work and do work in that application. Just be sure that, um, you know, we get that call and, and people say, well, it work on mine. I don't know until I know the, the control logic of that tankless water heater, let's say, or combi boiler, how it responds and how it um, modulates its output based on the flow rate or the a temperature differential and that. Some, they probably work fine. Others, I, we know they struggle with because people uh, have called us on that. So uh, call us if you need application help on that. We can, uh, we want to make sure that you get a valve that, um, uh, works properly in that application. Yeah, good question, Mark. Thanks. All right, anything else that I can uh, I can share or make up if I don't know an answer? <laughs> Are we opening mics? We can. Yeah. If anyone Anybody knows they have an open mic. Hand? Yeah, I think if anyone wants to raise their hand, uh, Mary will demic you or uh, no, not demic you. Uh, get, even I, I'm getting tired. Um, open you up, I guess. <laughs> Let me see Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Colin. Some friends on there. I haven't looked at the list at all when I was rolling. <clears throat> um, is that Sean? Did somebody raise a hand, Mary? Just some shy folks tonight, Bob. Um, just haven't seen the raised hands but always remember on these uh, evening editions we are more than happy to open up the mic for you we we love to hear from you and uh you know to continue the dialogue so just just know that that's an option for you in future webinars as well call me you can uh, text me you can call me you can get a hold of me at bob.roarcleffy.com that's uh you can remember that um certainly our tech support folks can help i don't think i have any other housekeeping at the end here do i mary let me check and see uh, and yeah, and we'll, we'll uh, Aaron's been nice to put a, uh, a thread on the uh, heating help there if you want to continue the conversation there. And certainly we can, uh, I'll hang out there and uh, be available to help you there. So, all right, should we call this one a wrap, team? Good job, Bob. Yep, thank you. Thanks to thank my you. team. Uh, be generous with your tools and uh, tiaras. That's a that's a good organization. They're doing a lot of good things there. And uh, go to their website. It's really interesting when you see who the some of the um, the people that work at that group and some of their backgrounds. There's a gal there that's a what a stonemason or something is one of the board directors and then um, <clears throat> uh, people in the trades that are you know the board members and actually running all those uh, camps and all those sessions that they do. So that's that's nice to see. All right, I think I'm going to let y'all. Uh, have the rest of your evening. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for supporting Kalefi. Uh, we're here to help you. We're here to help the industry. We love hearing from you. Send us pictures, send us stories. Uh, we like chatting with you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, team. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good job. <laughs>